uh, God has never spoken more uh, to than uh, you know a tenth grade boy than He's spoken to anyone else. Uh, he's God is clearly speaking quite a bit to those young teenage boys. The worst part for you was like you went through all the cute girls in youth group and tried to play that card, but uh, thankfully they the, did not hear the same the, message. The spirit of God is limited when your face looks like mine, unfortunately. Oh no, oh, no. <laughs> it's uh, limited. <laughs> Well, welcome to the Calvary Assembly podcast, where we have dialogues around tough questions, conversations through a biblical lens that affects our world today. I'm your host, Jonathan Sigmund, and I am joined by two of the pastors here at Calvary Assembly, Pastor Bob Reeves, Pastor Stephen Nichols. How are we doing out here, guys? Good. We're good. Excited to be here. Great. Great. So today is Valentine's Day, uh, set for release today on Valentine's Day. We are pre-recording this, but we wanted to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. Uh, but today we are actually talking about singleness. And we recognize that today can be a day that can have ampli amplified emotions uh, for everybody, um, but especially if you're single, sometimes this, this can have a lot of, yeah, extra emotions attached to it. And so for you, maybe uh, you've been single your whole life, maybe you're single once again, or maybe you've even gone through a divorce. And what, what I want to say to you is that uh, yeah, one of the most painful experiences you can have in the world is a breakup. And so uh, today uh, may have extra challenges associated with it for you. And what I want you to know, what we want you to know, is that you are loved, you are cherished by God, you are cared for, and we're going to have a conversation around singleness. And, and our hope is that this would be helpful and fruitful for you, regardless of where you're at on your journey. And we just want to be open and honest from the front end that all three of us who are on this podcast are married. And so we may have blind spots. And so we don't come in into this conversation thinking we have all the answers or everything figured out. But we want to have a conversation centered around scripture, centered around singleness and and talk about this topic. So uh, let me just jump right in and ask our first question to you guys. Why do you think having extended periods of singleness or, or a life that is called to be single can be so challenging? Stephen, I'll start with you. So I heard a, a quote uh, recently that I thought was uh, very meaningful, at least to me. Uh, it, it said that the problem with loneliness is not that you don't feel like you have anybody. It's that you feel like nobody has you. And it gets at this idea uh, that you can have many friends and you can have many people that you love and who you are close to, uh, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like anything's changed. You still feel the loneliness, and it feels like nobody has you, that nobody has, has put their arms around you. And I think that that can be hard uh, when you're single, that you can have really good friends and people that you love deeply, but it doesn't feel like somebody has you, and that can be so, so saddening sometimes and very, very hard to, to walk through life in that way. Yeah. I think, too, um, some people feel like they're in a form of pur purgatory. They can't really get their life started until they're with someone. And so there's a set of assumptions that go into that. But when you're dealing with those emotions, it's, it's super hard. It's super draining. And you actually wind up veering away from people at a time when being around other people could be helpful. So uh, tell me about what does scripture and what did Jesus have to say about singleness? Because I think it's different than the cultural message that can be sent, whether inside the church or outside of it. Uh, tell me about what scripture says. Yeah, it's, it's funny because uh, it can be somewhat surprising how Jesus viewed marriage and singleness, but also not so surprising if, if you've come to know who, who Jesus is. Uh, there's a story in one of the Gospels of Matthew in chapter 19 uh, where Jesus is having a heated conversation, as he normally does, with many of the Pharisees. And they're talking to Jesus about marriage and divorce and what's right and what's wrong. And, and Jesus places a high, high value on marriage and says, hey, you know, that God's original intention for marriage is that two would come together, they would be one flesh, and what, what God has, you know, joined together, let not man separate— and um, this was not the practice of the Pharisees, that they would just divorce for any reason whatsoever, even the very small things. Uh, and it was actually, it was very um, almost abusive to, to their wives. It was a very uh, 
terrible thing that they were doing, and Jesus was speaking to that. And because of Jesus' such high value on marriage, uh, the disciples left that conversation discouraged, and they're like, well, if that's true, if two should never separate, who then should be married? That's such a high standard that it seems uh, almost impossible, and they're discouraged. And Jesus tells them, and he says, well, yeah, actually, he says that those who can, those who are able to live this way without marrying, he said that those who can accept this should. And in fact, he tells the story of, of two different types of people uh, who have decided not to be married. In fact, one decided to be not to be married by choice. He they're called eunuchs, and, and some of them are being forced into that. They were forced into not being uh, intimate with with a spouse. And Jesus, in this conversation, elevates those individuals to the same level of those who are married, uh, and it, that's a huge big deal in their culture that the only way that you had any kind of importance or value was if you were married. Mm. And Jesus is, is now saying that even those, whether you are uh, that way by force, or if you chose a life of singleness, that you're at the same level of those who are married. It's a revolutionary statement. I don't think we can understand how big of a deal this was. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, Jesus wasn't just like saying this. He put his money where his mouth was and he lived a life of singleness. And if that doesn't attest to Jesus' Uh, value and importance of those who live a life of singleness. I don't know what does. Jesus thought very, very highly of people who who were single and lived that way. Yeah, I think in the in the ancient world, uh, honor was based around family. Like our, our concepts of honor are more individual in our culture, but in the ancient world, your family was the source of honor or dishonor to you. And so family was very important then. So you had to have a family and not just be part of one in terms of your birth, but be part of one in terms of creating a family. So I think that that created a set of challenges. And then also on top of that, their, their sense of security, what they were passing on, uh, they needed an heir to do that. So everything in the traditional culture was wrapped around this and it's what they honored. And traditional cultures tend to be more religious. So there is, uh, there's more brought into religion than what scripture actually says about it, just because the culture is speaking into it. So I think when people take a, a, a really close look at what scripture has to say, like the passage you just mentioned with Jesus, what they find out is a lot more freedom than they would have imagined that they would find in scripture. Yeah, Paul also, uh, you know, talks about in his letters too, he actually tells people, is like, he almost says it like exasperating, like, well, if you have to marry, then right. go ahead and get married. But it actually might be better in some cases that you don't. And Paul too was single and he did uh, amazing things for the church, for scripture and, and all of these things. So it, it's a big deal in the Bible and uh, it's, not, it's not an undervalued thing. I think you do see uh, Jesus and the New Testament de-idolizing marriage, yeah. mm -hmm. where uh, the culture has put it up so high. And, and it's not just religious things. We, we get the pressure from everyone. What fascinates me about this is the very people that pressure us to get into a marriage are the ones that will encourage us to get out of it when they don't approve of it. So uh, it's, a lot to, it's a lot to navigate. It's a lot to think. Yeah, so I think... Oftentimes, it feels like the church culture today places this extra emphasis on marriage. feels like singleness doesn't really get talked about and certainly doesn't get celebrated. And, and so I guess my, my question for you guys is, do you see the church at large placing an emphasis on marriage? And should they be doing this? Pastor Bob, I'll look at you first. That's good. I think what the church does is it places an emphasis on community. And then I think we, we move to some conclusions based on that, right? Uh, one of the challenges I see is that maybe uh, two individuals will start seeing each other, they become a couple, things don't work out, they wind up breaking up, and now they feel like they can't be part of the church community because their micro community was fractured. And I think that when we think like that, we're actually putting something out of perspective. The church does value community, but we also should be able to value people in our community that maybe just went through a relationship breakup. It's not a convenient conversation to have, and we're always worried we're gonna say the wrong thing. But being there for people is essential, and hopefully they'll feel welcome and, and included. Yeah. I think it's also important, too, that we don't go to the other end of the extreme, which I think people will often do in these kinds of things, like, well, marriage isn't even that cool anyway. It's like, no, like, the Bible does place a very high value on, on marriage. It is a really beautiful thing. 
And in fact, m much of the language in the Bible, uh, like the Old Testament and the Old, uh, or in the, in the New Testament, could also be called as the Old and the New Covenant. That it's and, and uh, God often talks about his people as if he's in this marriage relationship with them. So there's a lot of beauty there. And and the New Testament too talks about how Christ is um, like our, our, that we are married almost to Christ and we are the the bride of Christ. Um, so there's just a lot of imagery there that, that places that high importance there. It's good and important to recognize that. It's not a bad thing to know that. Uh, but then at the same time that, that we don't devalue one over the other, that both of those things, whether you choose to marry or you choose to be single, or maybe it's not your choice to be single, uh, that both are important. And, and the Bible values both of those things. And so that's a really important thing to keep in our mind, I think. So what about singles who are in a place where they're deeply desiring marriage? Maybe they're even feeling some levels of discontentment. Pastor Bob, what, what would you say to a person who's experiencing that? Well, that's complicated, isn't it? Um, to desire to be married is a good thing, but Scripture also tells us that not being married is a, a good thing. So where, where do we find ourselves in that? I do think that there are seasons in a person's life when it might not be the best option to be considering marriage because of what we're going through and our assumption that another person will fix us or they'll take care of things for us. And, and if we walk into a, a marriage based on that, we might not choose very wisely. The more needy we are, the, the less we will set our standards for what would be a healthy relationship for us because our heart just craves something, and especially if we're hurting. So what, what options can we think of then that, that would be helpful? If we're feeling ex especially needy, that might not be the best time to, to uh, the person you tolerate now, you probably won't be able to tolerate later. Well, it's also true that uh, it's not even just a singleness thing. I think it's just true for us in general that uh, we become very fixated on what's next in our life. And we, it, whether it's singleness or anything else, whether it's career or kids or uh, job, school, we're always fixated on, on what's next, what can I do next. And if we're in a season of singleness, we're so fixated on what's next, when's this relationship coming. And I think there's much to be missed of what God can do in the now and what God is doing to me in the season of life that I'm in. And if I'm always fixated on what could potentially be, I miss on what God could be saying to me right now. And um, so, yeah. yeah. I, I also, I was just talking to a young man and uh, he was in a dating relationship with someone and uh, there was something she declared very strongly about what her future was going to look like. And uh, it, uh, she did not want to have children. Now she may have had very good reasons for that, but this young man had figured out that that's something that was important to him. It is not his job to try to change her mind. Like that, that becomes something that really becomes difficult over time. And you're gonna feel a lot of pressure one way or the other on that. So because he knew enough about himself he can make a decision about that relationship. And one of the things that we have as a gift during a time of singleness is we can actually learn more about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when we're, in, uh, when we're connecting with other people, we can actually figure out whether this relationship has some stamina and some legs or whether there's some deal breakers down the road that we might be turning our back on, not paying attention to, and hoping somehow it just magically works out. Yeah, it reminds me of like youth group days back when uh, the they, either the boy or the girl will go up to the other one and be like, yeah, God told me that we're supposed to be together. Amen. And I, I tell you what, uh, God has never spoken more uh, to than, uh, you know, a 10th grade boy yeah, than he's spoken to anyone else. Uh, he's so God is clearly speaking quite a bit to those young teenage boys. The worst part for you was like you went through all the cute girls in youth group and tried to play that card, yeah. but thankfully they the, did not hear the same the, message. The spirit of God is limited when your face looks like mine, unfortunately. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> it's uh, limited. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So... Uh, you guys were talking a little bit about this in terms of compatibility with somebody. So if somebody is single and they are looking to date somebody, I feel like a lot of times what we think about is, you know, do we have the same interests? You know, do we like going to the same shows? Do we like the same movies? Do we, you know, we like kind of the same genre of music? And, you know, do we just kind of have good vibes together? And I, and I do think those things matter. But I'm curious as to, to your guys' opinion is, for somebody who's single and looking to get married, what should they be looking for in a spouse? 
I guess it's to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think we've, we've misdefined compatibility as finding someone who thinks like me, uh, who agrees with me all the time. And uh, that's uniformity, that's not compatibility. That, and probably you're not gonna find that person. You might find someone who pretends to be that person because of their own needs, but that doesn't uh, wear well over time. I think that what we want to find uh, is some things that we have um, uh, similar values on, for example, our faith in Christ, right? Um, I've talked to people who have, uh, have been in marriages that um, one was a believer, one was not. And what I can tell you is it's, it's not very often a source of anger. People expect there to be a lot of fights about that. It's not. It's a source of disappointment. So why set yourself up for that? You know, uh, well, maybe eventually they'll come to Christ. That's possible. But you have to know that that's a decision that they have to make with God. And while you can speak into their life, you can't make that decision for them. So I think there's really a lot of value in some spiritual compatibility. I think there's a uh, character. Uh, there's just issues of what's important to me. Do, do we share the same values? Are we on the same page? You know, is, is lying okay with one person and not another? Like, these are things that we have to, to know about. What, you know, how do you feel about uh, fidelity and honesty and integrity? And if we're not on the same page, that's just going to be a source of ongoing challenges. Mm -hmm. But they don't have to like the same sports you do, read the same books you do. I mean, some of the best conversations Sue and I have had have been in our disagreements or when we're not seeing something the same way. Uh, our, our conversations would be pretty boring if we just always finished each other's sentences. You know? Yeah, something you were saying, Pastor, I think, too, is you marry the person that is today, not the person you or you think they're going to become. Yeah, because I think deal. if you just try to project out and think they're going to change, <laughs> like somebody is going to change, but it's not all going to be in a positive direction. And so especially if you've got differences in you know, differences in different values and what you prioritize, like those are the things to pay attention to in a relationship, I think is super, super key. Well, even uh, even like not to get super logistical about it, but like if you have two very different views of w how you think you should handle your money, it's just going to be a source of just a ton of just disagreement all the time or how you view your church or ministry or how you view your family situation stuff like that like you're just setting yourself for a real bad time yeah. um so those seem small but it, it can be very big so i'm not saying you always have to be like you said in uniformity on all things but if your values are so different uh then it, it's gonna be a tough time um so yeah no i think you're exactly right so if if you guys were in a situation where you are single and you are trying to prepare to be married, what would you be doing to get ready for it? Yeah. So one of the things I found uh, that is one of the most important aspects of, of marriage, I it, from my own experience, is, is that marriage looks a lot like serving your spouse. And uh, I don't know why I didn't know that before I got married. You know? And maybe maybe that's on me. Uh, probably is because uh, my wife is a, a lot better than I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a lot of serving. So it's a lot of like when I want to do something, I'm going to lay down my needs, my desires so that I can serve her. And hopefully and the goal is that she would do the same. Um, and I think that if we get into marriage without that practice first, um, then again, we're just setting ourselves up for failure in a lot of ways that uh, we can't expect to jump into marriage thinking we're going to be good at these things. So um, I think that we should start taking intentional time and actions to learn how to serve people and learn how to do things that are not to my benefit, but to the benefit of others, to sacrifice something that I really enjoy so that it benefits others. That could be my friends. That could be um, my parents, that could be my siblings, it could be my coworkers, but learning how to serve people so that when I get into a marriage relationship, I've built these muscles and these skills already so that I can learn how to be sacrificially serving somebody in the same way, not to over spiritualize this, but in the same way that Christ has done that for me, um, that, uh, that he serves me. And uh, I think that that's what the marriage is supposed to look like. When I even think about this, 
as as a single person, how, how are you treating your parents? Like that's a long standing relationship and there's likely some conflicts that have occurred along your life. And I know every situation is different. So I'm not just blanket statement. Uh, you know, every situation is the same, but I, I'm always interested in how is this single person treating their parents? Like that, that's a telling sign to me. And then for us to look in, where how are we treating our parents? Like, what are the God-honoring ways and what are the not-so-God-honoring ways? And I know we can make all of our justifications and, and all of that, but I, I think that that's an important thing for us to look at in a potential mate, but also a thing for us to look inward at our own heart as we're preparing our own hearts for marriage, if that's something you're desiring. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that's a really good point. Like, back in the 1800s, people didn't go to entertainment venues uh, to go out. Uh, a, a young lady would call on someone and they would come over to the house and they would spend time on the porch or in the parlor. Uh, I don't know what a parlor is, but <laughs> evidently they had one uh, just for this reason. And, uh, and what would happen is they would get to know each other in the context of that family being there. And you could see how they're interacting with their family. Uh, somewhere in the, in the 1900s, uh, people started going to entertainment venues and what we're getting to see is how a person reacts when they're doing something they enjoy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good, but that's limited information. And uh, th there could be a lot of value in when I'm thinking about um, my life as a single, in what ways can I grow? And we pay attention to ourselves. We, we speak the truth to ourselves, right? Um, and we, I would recommend don't, don't try to make too much of marriage or too little of it. Because um, I think there's a strong uh, thing in our culture right now that, that they want to demean uh, the value of marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, who needs it? It's an outdated institution. If you make too much of it or too little of it, we tend to distort our own heart. So uh, I, would, I would aim at spending time with people, not just doing things that are fun, but doing real life stuff with people. I'm going to pause real quick and just note that, Pastor, you know about those dating situations from the 1800s <laughs> of history books and not because he was alive. Oh, then. dude, that's messed for, up. For anyone, for anyone who so, is there's, there's another funny thing about that is that uh, they, would, they would have candles that they would use that the parents would use. And when the candle got down, when it finally got down to a certain level, the, the young man who was visiting would have to go. And the parents would put got, put out shorter candles if they didn't like the guy, oh, and, and longer candles oh, if man. they did like the guy. So yeah, but I, I wasn't there. I okay. just heard about it. Yeah. You just heard about it from a friend from a friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great clarification as always. Well, uh, one thing I do just want to say to everybody, re regardless of whether you're where you're at, whether you are single, whether you're desiring to be married, married or not, I just I want you to know that. The aim of the walk of following Jesus is maturing our faith. The aim and the destination is not marriage. And Jesus spells that out. Paul spells right. that out. It, it is clear. The, the way that we grow is we pursue and we go after Jesus. And that, that should be all of our ultimate aim for every single one of us. But I also want you to remember this, is, is to remember that God doesn't see you differently based on your relationship status, whether you're single or whether you are married. And, and knowing that is life to your heart and to your soul. And so I just, I want that to resonate and marinate inside of you. And I, my, my hope is that this was a helpful conversation for you as we've talked and dialogued around singleness. Happy Valentine's Day to you. And we hope that you will join us again next time. Thank you.